Welcome, welcome all of you this evening to the first MLA Humanities in Five. Uh, I am your MC. Thank goodness I'm not one of the presenters. Because as you can imagine, what it would be like to have five minutes to present a complex scholarly project, no notes, no podium, and of course it's before a live audience and recorded for posterity. <laughs> so how many of you have ever tried something like this? <laughs> I think we have some people here that would love to trade with you. <laughs> So unlike a TED Talk where you would have 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and a, uh, a prompter to sort of help you with the script, this is completely uh, uh, prepared and, and memorized ahead of time. Um, <laughs> so uh, so I, I want you to join me in this experiment um, and keeping in mind the rules of this game um, and, and that, that this is an experiment for the MLA to uh, discover and sort of create, invent ways of presenting our, um, our uh, scholarly research to broad audiences. Um, so these presentations are meant to be accessible. They're meant to engage a broad audience and you are um, that audience for tonight. So um, our first our first presentation is uh, by Michael Barabe. Michael is uh, Edwin Erie Sparks Professor of Literature and Chair of the University Faculty Senate at Penn State University. He is author of 10 books to date, including Public Access, Literary Theory, and American Cultural Politics, Life as We Know It, A Father, A Family, and an exceptional child, and what's liberal about the liberal arts, classroom politics and bias in higher education. In 2015, he published The Humanities, Higher Education, and Academic Freedom, Three Necessary Arguments, Three Necessary Arguments, pardon me, I lost my place, um, Three Necessary Arguments, Co-authored with Jennifer Ruth, his ninth book, The Secret Life of Stories, From Don Quixote to Harry Potter, How Understanding Intellectual Disability Transforms the Way We Read, was published by NYU Press in early 2016. In October 2016, Beacon Press published Life as Jamie Knows It, An Exceptional Child Grows Up, which was written with extensive input from Jamie himself. He served three terms, as AAUP's committee on AAUP's Committee A on Academic Freedom and Tenure from 2009 to 2018. Two terms on the AAUP National Council, um, on the AAUP National Council from 2005 to 2011, and two terms in the International Advisory Board of the Consortium of Humanities Centers and Institutes from 2011 to 2017. In 2012, he was president of the Modern Language Association. From 2010 to 2017, he served as the director of Penn State's Institute for the Humanities, for the Arts and Humanities. Michael Barabe. Wait, 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 wait. Did you say five minutes? I'm just gonna make some stuff up, all right? <clears throat> so in The Secret Life of Stories, I tried to create some space for the analysis of fanciful, um, speculative, non-realistic depictions of disability, and to do that, I had to push back gently against some critics and theorists in the field who insist that the representation of people with disabilities must be realistic, right? must be accurate, whether it's in literature, film, TV, advertising, representation of people with disabilities should be accurate. And I thought, well, you know, what about a novel like Philip K. Dick's Martian Time Slip? It was published in 1964. It may be the first novel to feature a character diagnosed with autism on Mars. And you could come away from that novel going, well, you know, that's, that's not even remotely realistic, you know. 
um, people with autism can't actually see decades and centuries into the future and warp everybody else's senses of time. It's not accurate. So, in the book, I adduce the films Dumbo and Total Recall for their fanciful, speculative, non-realistic depictions of disability. And I thought, well, look, if you're going to say, well, baby elephants really can't have ears that large, or even worse, <clears throat> it's silly to think of these Martian mutants who have stomachs with fetus-like growths that have psychic powers on Mars, probably you're missing the point. And if you were to object that, you know, object to the association of the X-Men with disability on the grounds that real people with disabilities can't bend steel with their minds or change their shape, you would be effectively denying fiction one of its ancient prerogatives, that of making stuff up. You know, making stuff up. I used to think that the disciplines of the humanities were endlessly fascinating because they touched potentially on every single thing humans have done or thought and put into writing from the moment we figured out how to put thoughts into writing. But lately, there's all this new work on what you might call the boundaries of the human, radically interdisciplinary inquiries into the relation between the human and the non-human worlds, whether it's lichens and bacteria, birds and bees, plastic, polar bears, uh, polar ice caps, artificial intelligence. And I've been more and more drawn to the still sometimes devalued genre of science fiction. Because I thought here we have an entire genre of literature whose motto might as well be another world is thinkable. In other words, our field not only covers all of human languages, literatures, histories, and philosophies, and relations with the non-human world, but a whole mess of things that don't actually exist. And this is not necessarily frivolous stuff. Susan Squire argued many years ago that we were thinking of outlandish things like in vitro fertilization about 50 or 60 years before IVF became a thing. And we were doing it in science fiction. And what's more, we were also thinking of the ethical, legal, and social implications of new technologies like in vitro fertilization because science fiction can be serious business. Now, I know there are people who don't believe that. Especially in the mainstream literary world, they are convinced, many people, that science fiction cannot be serious literature. And, you know, I got that. They have a point. There's really no way you can write a serious work of fiction that explores the <clears throat> human condition if you populate it with, like, supernatural beings or society of talking horses or a six-headed man-eating monster who lives on a rock in the middle of the sea. But I still have one question. While we've been doing all this new work on the boundaries of the human, and developing these speculative, fanciful, non-realistic modes of representation. Who the hell fell asleep and let the business theorists lay proprietary claim to the term creativity? What is that about? It's like one of the biggest buzzwords in business now, creativity, excuse me, creativity is our gig. The humanities, the arts, theater, music, this is what we do, this is what we study. And the literary part of it, our contribution to the project of the humanities is to serve as the department of making stuff up, or maybe the department of studying made up stuff. Because we know what literature can do. We know it can literally do anything. Um, I forgot my mic, I'm sorry. Banter. Oh, banter. <laughs> Okay, so I'm 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 in, I'm entrusted with the uh, responsibility of bantering with the speaker and <laughs> um, totally ad hoc. So um, and and I, I and also just this is my first uh, experience at this. So I also forgot to mention that there's a fun fact about Michael. Um, Michael is an excellent hockey player, and his other career would have been in the NHL. Not even a chance. <laughs> Not even a chance. Um, lower level, um, you know, ECHL, AHL, uh, wearing a, a, a jersey with a, a cartoon character on it, yeah. So is there any connection between your interest in hockey and your interest in the non-human? <laughs> yeah, obviously. I mean, come on, there's nothing like the relationship between humans and the ice wolves, <laughs> which I think is Hartford. Um, <laughs> No, I hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, actually, but I have uh, said and, and thought and put into writing um, that the only two things I felt completely natural doing uh, growing up was skating and writing. Mm -hmm. So whatever that's worth. 
Is it is it is it like a zone that you go into? Totally. Yeah. Um, although I actually think this is. Uh, <clears throat> I have another five minutes for this theory. There's an inverse relation between the amount of action in a sport and the quality of writing about it, right? <laughs> so the best writing in sports is about baseball and golf. Mm -hmm. And it's as if there isn't enough time to be contemplative in hockey, <laughs> with the single exception being Ken Dryden, the former great goaltender of the Montreal Canadiens, and his book, The Game, is actually one of the best books written on sports of any kind. But otherwise, it's a kind of an inverse relationship. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And, and, and you, you mentioned um, sort of human interest and in, in thinking about um, the non-human that is not necessarily easy to love. <laughs> Bacteria, lichen, you know. Well, like, some of it does how? try to. Yeah. Well, we, 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 we couldn't have life without them. For let's, let's be grateful for that. And they're helping us do stuff right now. You know, the bacteria are running us. We're just their vehicles. Um, but no, there's, there's aspects of the non-human that are you know, trying to kill us. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'm, I'm reading a science fiction trilogy now in which the Earth itself is uh, taking its revenge uh, as we speak, <laughs> as it should. Um, but no, I. I um, I, I, I took a long time just to under appreciate how clever dogs were, let alone you know octopuses, <laughs> right? And um, I, I really did grow up pretty you know speciesist, mm -hmm. and getting that undone is is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> about the other non-human, I'm just going to borrow something from a postdoc I had at the institute, Heather Davis, who's I, I, I was a nod to her when I said plastic. Her book is on plastic, and when I interviewed her, I said, so why plastic? You know, everyone's talking about plasticity, right? Everyone, right, brain, brain plasticity or and um, she said, no, I, I really mean plastic. And I said, why? You know, if you want something non-human, why plastic? And she said, because it's not uranium. <laughs> like, oh, you got the job right there. I know exactly what you mean, right? It's so not us, right? But uranium is still organic. It still has a half-life. Plastic is scary shit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Michael. Our next uh, speaker, presenter, is um, Deborah Holstein. Uh, Deborah Holstein is professor of English at Columbia College here in Chicago, where she served as dean of the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences from 2007 to 2014. Previously, she was chair and professor of English at Northern Illinois uh, University, uh, professor of English and special assistant to the provost at Governor State University. She is past editor of the premier journal in composition writing studies, college composition, and communication. Her publications include Rhetoric, Rhetoric Choices, a Reader for Writers, Who Says, a, Re a Writer's Research, and the Princeton Hall Anthology of Women's Literature. Her new book, co-authored with uh, Danielle uh, Akaline, is Methods of Argument, which was published in November 2018 by Oxford University Press. Fun fact. Okay. Fun fact, if I may. Uh, she's a big fan of both Fred Astaire and Alfred Hitchcock. At age 50-something, she was a bar mitzvah, uh, or having certified herself by studying Hebrew and learning the tune to read the law on the Sabbath something women were not permitted to do until recently and only in some congregations. The title of her talk today is Hebraic Sources of Jesuit Rhetoric. On, hi. I am not now, nor have I ever been a Jesuit, much less a Catholic. However, the Jesuits interest me tremendously. This new project is really something that teaches us something that we've learned many times, which is that traditions, categories, initiatives that we think come to us fully formed or that we are conditioned to think are fully formed are anything but inviolate or that they're monolithic in any way. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of that order of Jesuit priests wished he had been born a Jew. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Why? Because he wished he had had the same blood as that of his Lord. So think about this. As he's forming the order many centuries ago, Jews are incredibly oppressed, or at least that time, Jews are incredibly oppressed. 
If a Christian is seen consorting with a Jew, he or she can be put in jail. There is a massacre in the 1300s that leads many people to either be forced to convert or die. So it's not surprising that in the early times of the order, given the way that Ignatius felt about the blood of his Lord, that he invited men who were steeped in Jewish intellectual tradition, who were learned, who were educated, who had been committed Jews, but who were prohibited from being public intellectuals or practicing their intellectual craft in public. He invited them to join the early order after they had converted, of course. Assimilation means erasure, right? Conversion means erasure. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, if someone converts to Judaism, that person is Jewish. You never mention where he or she or they had come from. That's very important. So imagine if you're in an environment of tremendous oppression, you convert to Catholicism, you are invited to join the Jesuit order, you may take the boy out of synagogue, but do you take Torah and study and erudition out of the boy? So my question, and what I hope to figure out, is to what extent is that which we call Jesuit rhetoric influenced by those early conversos, as they were called, those early Jesuits who had converted from Judaism, from Sephardic Judaism, who had joined the order, who helped Ignatius Loyola shape the order into what it became educationally, rhetorically, and in many, many other rich ways. How do we ferret out through reverse engineering, as one of my colleagues said yesterday, how do we ferret out what those contributions were? However, this teaches us once again, as I mentioned earlier, that things that we assume come to us fully formed or that we're encouraged to think are fully formed are in fact even more complex than they seem to be. Thank you. You still need banter. Oh. Banter. 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 And I still have a minute and a half. An hour and, th and yeah. Among yourself. <laughs> we got a minute and a half. Go ahead. Yeah, Just relax. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Deborah. Um, so it seemed to me that the takeaway that, that, uh, that I found was sort of surprising ways in which um, influences can happen across lines that may seem like they're barriers. Exactly. And, um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering, so you, you mentioned the Jesuits sort of taking in um, Jewish, con uh, Jewish conversos. Uh, do you see any influence or any sort of um, reception the other way around? You mean Je Jesuits on Judaism? Yeah. Is there, is there a traffic both ways? And that may be irrelevant completely, so I don't know. Well, I'm thinking about it. When you think about all of the people who were forced to convert, yeah. then clearly there was an influence. Yeah. But those people were no longer Jewish. I mean, there are many Jesuits to this day who will talk about their Jewish ancestry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's extremely significant because you can't just flip and not bring with you everything that made you appealing, in this case, to Ignatius to become part of his nascent yeah. order to right, begin with. Right. So clearly there have to be, in that wonderful Jesuit tradition of education, of the tradition of eloquence, as Cynthia Gannett and John Brereton talk about in their wonderful book, mm -hmm. there have to be things, <laughs> mm -hmm. for want of not very elegant way of putting it, that have not only influenced but embedded themselves in these practices that we now can consider just Jesuit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is there something about the Jesuit order that particularly sort of makes this possible? Because I'm thinking, I mean, in my own field, Arabic studies, um, the earliest dictionaries of, of Arabic English were, were made by Jesuits. Uh, J.G. Hava in Lebanon made this incredible uh, dictionary that, that we still use um, as the go-to for poetry. 
And I'm just wondering, is there, do you find something particular about the Jesuits that makes them receptive? Now, uh, the Jesuits, as I'm sure many of you know, are known for their emphasis mm -hmm. on literacy, on education. Uh, in fact, I would say that among Catholics, to borrow a term, they are the people of the book, so people to speak, as it were. Yeah. And they, uh, that, I think, resonates with the notion that there would have been a number of significant Hebraic influences that embedded themselves in that complex and rich tradition. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you. So our next speaker um, is uh, Caritha Mitchell. Uh, Caritha is Associate Professor of African American Literature at Ohio State University. Uh, Caritha Mitchell is a literary historian, cultural critic, and Associate Professor of English at Ohio State University, which I just said. Um, she specializes, I repeat myself intentionally sometimes. She specializes in African American literature, racial violence in, the U, in US history, and contemporary culture, as well as black drama and performance. Her, 2000, her 2011 study, Living with Lynching, African American Lynching Plays, Performance and Citizenship, 1890 to 1930, won book awards from the American Theater and Drama Society and from the Society for the Study of American Women Writers. Mitchell's scholarly articles include James Baldwin, performance theorist, uh, James Baldwin, performance theorist, Things the, th Sings the Blues for Mr. Charlie, and Love in Action, which draws parallels between racial violence in the last turn of the century and anti-LGBT violence today. She is editor of Broadway Edition, and um, she is editor of the Broadway Edition of Frances Harper's 1892 novel, Lola Leroy, and she recently completed her second monograph, From Slave Cabins to the White House, Homemade Citizenship in African American Culture, her public work has recently appeared in CNN, The Huffington Post, uh, and she has been quoted in NBC News, by NBC News, PBS NewsHour, NPR's Morning Edition. On Twitter, you can find her at Prof. Corey. Fun fact, Caritha is a serious athlete uh, who runs to inspire her writing. She documents her runs and motivates her wide readership with stories about how running can be a catalyst for writing. One look at Caritha's smiling face with beads of sweat trickling down gives you an idea of how fierce she is on the runner's and scholar's path. Her talk today is entitled, Not About Protest. Caritha Mitchell. Historians and literary critics have been getting it wrong. Teachers and general readers have been getting it wrong. We've all been viewing African-American culture through the lens of protest. We think in terms of oppression and resistance, as in lynching and anti-lynching campaigns, or segregation and anti-segregation activism. If we encounter black literature or art that does not respond to domination, we treat it as evidence that African Americans affirm themselves by creating spaces of refuge and escape. In other words, we operate as if African Americans either ignore the injustices that they face or completely protest. This is a mistake because affirming oneself and facing violence often go together. African Americans have always focused more on accomplishment than on protest, but this fact has been overlooked because everyone is taught to assume that so-called minorities can only react. But the truth is this, black people march toward accomplishment and white people react often with hostility. Uh, for example, you wouldn't need segregation if African Americans were actually inferior and couldn't compete. 
To understand that black culture is not about protest, Americans need to acknowledge what I call know your place aggression. I define know your place aggression as the flexible dynamic array of forces that answer the achievements of marginalized groups such that their success brings aggression as often as praise. Americans celebrate the accomplishments of white men, but any progress made by those who are not straight, white, and male is answered with a backlash that essentially says, know your place. U.S. citizenship technically extends beyond straight white men with property, but citizen still refers to a particular demographic, and all others are treated like guests whose membership cards can always be revoked. Know Your Place aggression comes in many forms, from microaggressions to assault to murder, but the message is the same. Certain people do not belong. If stated aloud, the sentiment might be, you may have a higher grade point average than I do, but you're still just a, or you may be the best tennis player of our generation worldwide, but you're a black woman, so I can put you down by making fun of your body. Or you may be speaking on the House floor about the lack of patriotism it takes to block Americans' access to health care, but you're a black woman, so I can distract from your message by making fun of your hair. Know Your Place Aggression is the context in which I examine black expressive culture from the mid-19th century to the present, including Michelle Obama's public persona as First Lady. While Mrs. Obama embodied the role of mom in chief with dignity and grace, the backdrop to her impeccable performance included a disrespected and sometimes lynched Barack Obama. A state representative shouted, you lie, while Obama addressed Congress in 2009, and a governor shoved her finger in the commander in chief's face. There are images like this circulating on the internet, receiving likes on Facebook, and sometimes it's a life-size dummy made to look like Obama. But the most striking example emerged after Clint Eastwood's empty chair routine. At the 2012 Republican National Convention, Eastwood pretended to speak to Obama while he chastised in an empty chair, and the next day, an empty chair hung from a noose in Austin, Texas. Could the message be any clearer? You may be president of the United States of America, but you're still a... Uh, Americans will not only ask to see your papers, birth certificate, transcripts, some will relish the idea of seeing you in a noose. Because African Americans have long recognized this country's commitment to know your place aggression, black literature and art often acknowledge racist violence, but not primarily to protest. African Americans simply affirm themselves at the same time that they note that the resulting success will inspire aggression as often as praise. Thank you, Caritha. It's a tough gig. It's a tough gig. Um, so Caritha, one of the things that I sort of uh, noticed in running through your slides and your presentation is the way in which violence, um, lynching in particular, uh, or metaphors, um, lynching as a metaphor, shapes the political landscape, America's political landscape. and. And I'm wondering, um, what, what, are, what, are the, what's, what, are, what is the structure, the infrastructure that continues to enable that to happen? I really do think that it's know your place aggression. I really do think that it is this country's tendency to respond to any success. And I mean just the basics of, I don't know, thinking I'm human. Mm -hmm. Because everything about this society is structured to make sure that I don't see myself in any kind of positive light. So if I do see myself in a positive light, that invites 
know your place aggression. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's really structured in everything about how this nation works, right? If a Latina gets a job, she's not welcomed into the profession in the same way that that white straight man will be. Mm -hmm. And that is built in to how everything is structured. I automatically need to wonder if she got a handout, mm -hmm. right? Or if a Latino person starts a business, suddenly their entrepreneurial spirit is the reason we need to be worried about a taco truck on every corner mm -hmm. any other entrepreneur we're happy that it's you know no not any other a white male entrepreneur yeah. we're happy right and right. so i think that it literally is structured into this nation that if you're not in that demographic then your success is a problem yeah thank you very much karitha our next presenter is alden lynn nielsen uh, George and, Bar and Barbara Kelly, Professor of American Literature at Penn State University. Uh, Alden is a critic and poet. Uh, his scholarly books include Reading Race, White American Poets, and the Racial Discourse in the 20th Century, which received the Samla uh, Studies Prize and Black Chant, Languages of African American Postmodernism. He has received the, uh, a Darwin Turner Award, the Larry Neal Award for Poetry, two Gertrude Stein Awards for Innovation, and the Josephine Miles Award for his poetry in Integral Music, Languages of African American Innovation, and the American Book Award for Don't Deny My Name, Words and Music in the Black Intellectual Tradition. Fun fact. Alden is a guitar player who has uh, been in bands since he was in high school, playing rock and roll, R&B, pop, jazz, blues, and some doo-wop in anything Bob Dylan. And for the past four summers, he's played guitar when he, when, when he teaches in Wuhan, China. He also plays, I mean, harmonica. Please join me for Alden Nielsen. Thank you. Probably be more specific. <laughs> I'm a stand-up tragedian. In the words of the late Amiri Baraka, I substitute for the dead lecturer, which is all a way of saying I'm a poet critic, living precariously on that slash mark that our institutions insist on trying to drive into our writing lives. Uh, this also means that I'm something of a conundrum to administrations. I'm a poet who doesn't teach creative writing. I'm a critic who writes in lyric mode as often as he writes in peer-reviewed published essays. I should mention these faces you see up here, you can blame them as the responsible parties. These are the uh, teachers and friends who told me that such a thing was possible to do. I hope you recognize most of their faces. As a scholar, critic, and teacher, um, there are several things I'm concerned with very broadly, uh, histories of English language poetry, uh, in particular African-American poetry post-World War II on to today. Uh, I have also worked considerably, as you might have gathered from some of the titles that were read in the introduction, on questions of racial formation, racial discourse, how we talk about race, how race exists in language. If race is a social construction, we need to know how it keeps getting constructed so we can construct it some other kinds of ways. That's one of the things I work in. Um, some people might think poetry is an odd place to do that, but that to me is a sort of a central location for this sort of thing. Um, I'm also concerned with trying to bring renewed attention uh, to African American writers who have made significant contributions to the very trends, theories, poetics that we've been talking about for the last 40 years, but who are infrequently acknowledged. Um, fun fact, Penn State hired Michael and me the same year precisely so that we'd be the only university on the face of the earth with, with uh, 
two specialists in a particular poet who <laughs> is named Melvin B. Tolson. Um, some still lesser known figures like Russell Atkins who was writing essays about deconstruction back in 1948, uh, Eloise Lofton, Jane Cortez, and so forth. Um, so with my students, with my critical writing, that's the sort of thing I do all the time. Uh, almost all my work is concerned with race in, in one way or in other, no matter what the uh, overall topic is. Uh, but quite simply, as a poet, um, I never wanted to be the man that broke your heart. I only wanted to be the man who wrote the song that broke your heart. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm reclaiming my time. No. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the, the, the tune that you opened up with, uh, what, what significance does that have for you? Uh, well, since it didn't exist until that moment, it has the, <laughs> it has the significance of spontaneous invention. Uh, here's the connection between musicians and poets, well, one of many connections. Uh, I've talked about this at previous MLAs on <clears throat> jazz poetry and so forth. What poets like me are interested in is the spontaneous creation of new forms. Mm -hmm. You know, we are tremendously interested, like the Ulipo group, in older forms, but we're also interested in constantly creating new forms, and uh, any good musician is doing exactly that. So. Um, I'd rather write poems than write song lyrics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one of the other things that you're famous for, uh, especially here at the MLA, are the off-site poetry readings, which... Uh, which there isn't one of this year, I'm afraid. <laughs> which there isn't one this year. But tell, tell me more about that. Like, yeah. how, well, this, how did that start? This, and, and this started, um, uh, for the two people in the room who don't know this, I grew up in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And one of the first MLAs I was at was in Washington, D.C. So I called up Rod Smith, who some of you may know is the publisher of Ariel uh, and Edge Editions. And uh, we noticed that Charles Bernstein and Bob Perlman were going to be at the MLA. So at a place uh, in Adams Morgan, it's not there anymore, uh, we had the first of these off-site readings. It's also unusual in that uh, Marjorie Perloff read a paper at that off-site <laughs> We've never repeated that. But they kept growing. Um, there wasn't one every year, but for 20 years there was an off-site MLA reading almost every year. And God bless the MLA uh, and Rosemary and the program committee. Uh, when it came time for the 20th anniversary, they actually made uh, room for an on-site off-site reading that was open to the public like this event. Um, and so we celebrated the 20 years. Uh, Charles Bernstein and Rod Smith, who had hosted that first one, were there. And then the next night we all trooped over to another location where 50 poets read. Mm -hmm. um, we've had some gargantuan ones here in Chicago at past MLAs. I think it just got to be too big for people to feel like they wanted to take on. But one of the reasons he knows about this is, um, in addition, normally I'm taking pictures. My friend here and I were comparing cameras in the elevator, but I don't get to take any pictures because they made me sit up here. But the other thing I did was record most of those off-site readings, and at least eight or nine of them are on pin sound on the web. So even today, you can go and hear some of those marathons, and I think you'll be really happy you did. Every kind of poet you can imagine is there. Thank you much, Alden. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter, is uh, Anjali Prabhu. Uh, she is professor of French and Francophone studies at, Wesley, at Wellesley uh, College and was until recently director of the Newhouse Center for the Humanities at the same institution. Her books include Hybridity, Limits, Transformation, Prospects, and Contemporary Cinema of Africa and the Diaspora. Anjali is currently on a fellowship at École des Hautes Etudes uh, en sens social in Paris. Anjali, fun fact, is the superhero of soccer moms. <laughs> she has, uh, we did research for this, it's a serious operation. <laughs> she has two sons who play in the New England football club. On weekends, Anjali can be seen on the road with a van full of elite soccer players headed to a championship tournament. Please join me in welcoming Anjali Prabhu. Thank you so much. I should uh, apologize quickly for my title, which is actually relevant to the larger project from which I'm drawing. Um, and so I'll, I'll refer to that larger project, though the idea that I want to present here is something much more simple. 
which is what I want to offer you today, is the suggestion that notions such as creative genius or radical politics become altered when they are properly historicized rather than simply understood historically, that is, in their relation to the past and present trends. The second thing that I want to offer is that in order to operate such a process of historicizing, we do have to understand change as it manifests in collective movement, rather than resorting to isolating events, whether they be successes, failures, development, or however you'd like to see them, uh, that they might be too easily ascribable to a particular um, group or a particular individual. Now, the largest study that I'm drawing from is based on 18th century India uh, during um, the height of French and British rivalry. Of course, this rivalry was going on in skirmishes in North America, in the Caribbean, in Europe itself, certainly in the Indian Ocean and Mauritius. But I focus on um, uh, southern India where this little orange uh, part that you see is, was really the last bastion of resistance to uh, a British India. The uh, person that you see there, the figure is called Tipu Sultan, and he was the ruler of that little kingdom that you saw. Uh, um, this was a period, I should emphasize, when uh, Britain was sort of taking over, a British government was taking over the East India Company, and therefore it's moving from being like a mercantile operation to colonialism um, proper. So um, Orientalism, Edward Said's Orientalism, I don't have to rehearse it, uh, is quite important to my larger study, but I want to just pick up on a few points uh, from it that will be relevant to us today. One is it's a mode of discourse. It's based on a distinction between the East and the West. And um, it's not relevant, um, sorry, Said's Orientalism is not relevant to a comparison between Orientalism's discourse and the real Orient. Um, Keep those points in mind. What I'm going to show you uh, are two examples. One is taken from um, uh, the representation of Tipu in contemporary India. So he's either a tyrant or he is a hero. And you see these two representations on the left, I'm sorry, yes, on the left uh, is a, a textbook that was rewritten to correct the nationalist view, the secular view, and to paint him as a Muslim tyrant. And then the other one was a sitcom that, I'm sorry, a, a television serial that was brought out which celebrated Tipu as a hero. Uh, these are, um, these three quotations, I won't read them, are uh, characterizations from British um, correspondence about Tipu as a tyrant, et cetera, et cetera. Recently in India, um, the Taj Mahal was removed from a um, brochure, tourist brochure, because uh, it was a Hindu government that decided that uh, we don't celebrate Muslim achievements. On the other side, we had uh, uh, the Congress government celebrating Tipu, uh, Tipu's birth anniversary with much fanfare. So what I'm trying to show you is that there are two aspects, both focusing on Tipu as either a hero or as a uh, tyrant. That's the first example, and uh, it'll become clearer what I'm trying to do. The second example is from Yves Saint Laurent. Uh, his India collection that came out in the 70s was inspired by, if you saw the previous images, of uh, images from the Louvre of 18th century representations of Indian princes, and of them, Tipu is one of them. Uh, funnily enough, you can see Indian fashion in the 70s looked nothing like that. So uh, Yves Saint Laurent's inspiration really was from an 18th century image that he got from the Louvre and places like that. So it's not just that we can see that Yves Saint Laurent had cultural capital, as Bourdieu might say, and access to a certain view of India that has remained timeless and thus enters into his dreaming, he dreamt of India, or just that the British Orientalist views of Tipu um, uh, uh, come back today in the 20th century. Rather, France's waning empire in India, notwithstanding its actual capital today, not just the cultural capital, that inheres in its museums, creates an elite and creates the conditions of possibility for that kind of dreaming. And in the second case, the power of orientalizing discourses is seen in the enduring manner in which it reappears two and a half centuries later from within a nation that has supposedly achieved independence and risen above its masters. Instead, British orientalist discourses that characterize Tipu come back. <laughs>
Show, show my last slide. Show my last slide. I object. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anjali. Thanks. Should I go back there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, Anjali, how is it that you came to this project? Um, how, how is it that you came to this project? Um, I'll try and give a short answer. Yeah. So uh, I think my work has always engaged a British and French colonialism. My first book was on Mauritius. Um, and I've always worked between um, French and um, Anglophone theorists. Uh, I suppose this is a form of uh, returning home. Mm -hmm. um, that's a short answer. Great, great. And, and how did you stumble upon Yves Saint Laurent's sort of uh, dream of, of colonial India? Uh, I went to the Yves Saint Laurent Museum mm -hmm. um, just uh, actually about five, um, about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a hunch that his um, creations were coming from a different view of India than a real engagement with mm -hmm. India. Mm -hmm. And indeed, that's what I found. Uh, so it's not that profound, but I thought that in the images, uh, they still remained very striking to mm -hmm. me. Great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So our next speaker um, and final speaker will be uh, Devani Lozer. Uh, she is Foundation Professor of English at Arizona State University. She is the author and editor, uh, she is author or editor of seven books on literature by women, and she is the 2018 Guggenheim Fellow and NEH Public Scholar. Her most recent book, The Making of Jane Austen, was named a publisher a Publisher's Weekly Best Summer Book, uh, nonfiction, and received the Inside Higher Education Higher Ed's Re Reader's Choice Award. Um, it just came out in paperback, as a matter of fact, uh, with a new foreword. Um, and um, and um, as well, two more books that I need to mention, uh, British Women's ri Women Writers and the Writing of History, 1670 to 1820 and Women Writers and Old Age in Great Britain, 1750 to 1850. Um, all are published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, her Penguin Deluxe Classics edition of Sense and Sensibility is just out. And as a matter of fact, uh, there will be a signing of copies tomorrow at the Penguin Random House booth here um, in the hotel uh, from 4.30 to 5.30. Later this year, uh, her edited collection of Austin quotes entitled The Daily Jane Austen will be published by the University of Chicago Press. Fun fact, she has a following in roller derby. In roller derby, she skates under the name Cold Stone Jane Austen. Stone and Cold. Stone Cold. Stone, I'm sorry. <laughs> stone Cold, I'm sorry, it's just a little dyslexia. Stone Cold Jane Austen, and she is faculty advisor uh, to the a a ASU Derby Devils. Uh, the title of her talk is Unpacking the Making of Jane Austen. Join me in welcoming Devoni Lozer. Thank you, Sam. Jane Austen, she may require no introduction with greater name recognition than any other English author not named William Shakespeare. Since the 19th century, we've talked about Jane Austen in relation to Shakespeare, often in dismissive terms, referring to her as the little female Shakespeare or Shakespeare in miniature. But last month, the London Times ran an op-ed that declared Austen the greatest genius of English literature, arguably greater than Shakespeare. Take that, Shakespeare. <laughs> Austin is making her move. How did she achieve this stature? And we've generally told this story this way. She published six novels. She never married. When she died, it was with little sense that her modest literary fame would grow astronomically. Critical acclaim came slowly, but today she attracts avid admirers, sometimes called Janeites. Now, these things may be facts, but they're also a partial story. And it's one that we've repeated often. It's not exactly like putting together a kit, but in some ways when we repeat certain parts and not others, we're making 
Jane Austen. I especially appreciate this quote summing up the challenges. So much has been written concerning Miss Austen that there seems to be need for some sort of apology or explanation for putting forth any new volume. That's literary critic Walter Harris Pollock, and he wrote that line in 1899. <laughs> Now, I admit I felt a little bit like Pollock when I began my book. People would ask me, is there really anything new to say about her? But I began with a stubborn hunch. I suspected that we'd left out significant parts of how Austen became a household name. Received wisdom had it that Austen's greatness was due to other greats, due to her collateral descendants, due to big name authors, and due to well-heeled literary critics, most of them male. We said that these greats helped make the masses see Austen as great for all. It was a kind of trickle-down theory of how her literary fame was made. Then we said in 1995, the BBC Pride and Prejudice miniseries and the Sense and Sensibility film heated up her popularity once again. But I wondered, were there any 19th century Emma Thompsons or Colin Firths? It turns out that the answer is yes. There were dozens, hundreds of artists, actors, activists, educators, politicians, directors, playwrights who set out to solidify Austen's fame. Most literary histories, however, it either ignored them or dismissed them as lightweight. But in fact, when we look more closely, we see that some of the effects they had were profound. Take, for example, Rosina Filippi, Austen's first dramatist. Her duologues and scenes selected out Austen's admirable domestic protest speeches and put them in the mouths of amateur actors. Felipe's scenes served as female empowerment tools in countless girls' schools over several decades. Or take Winifred Mayo. Not only did she co-direct the first professional stage adaptation of an Austen novel, a Pride and Prejudice adaptation and act in it as it's Elizabeth Bennet. She also was the first person to take the stage as Jane Austen in the era's most famous suffrage play. Helen Jerome, too, made her mark. She was the one who wrote the play that became the first big budget Broadway Austen hit. What she did that was unusual was took hero Mr. Darcy and turned him into a heartthrob 60 years before Colin Firth in his wet white shirt. Now, coincidentally, Jerome's, Colin, uh, Jerome's Darcy was also named Colin. His name was Colin Keith Johnston. Jerome had him deliver the curtain-closing final passionate kiss. But he was also caricatured in The New Yorker for his proto-Elvis pelvic move. <laughs> so Jerome made Darcy a sex symbol for the first time. At the same time, she weakened Austen's original Elizabeth. These are the stories that my book sets out to tell. And what they show us is that Austen was not made great only by collateral descendants trying to protect her ladylike reputation or by professors professing her greatness. Unsung pop culture innovators also played a significant role in keeping her novels alive and keeping readers coming back to her stories. It ought to make us see a little bit differently the zombies, the guinea pigs, and yes, even the action figures that circulate today. Perhaps in the future we will need to see these as neither lightweight nor miniature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Devaney. Woo, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Sigh of relief. <laughs> this part's easy. <laughs> so I'm curious, um, with Jane Austen, um, her, there's, there's sort of an asymmetry of her fame in life, her fame uh, posthumously. Yes. Why, why is there this asymmetry? Well, she did have some modest literary fame in her own day. I think mm -hmm. we've underplayed what her reputation was. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's one way that we really need to start seeing her differently. Uh, but I think there was a slowness to recognize the importance of the novel. The novel had a different status at this time. And I think Sir Walter Scott was casting such a large shadow over everything that a lot of women writers of the 18-teens were very well regarded in their own time slipped out of history. Uh, mm -hmm. Austen didn't slip out, it's just that her fame you know, didn't rise as quickly as Scott's, which mm -hmm. has had a different trajectory. Right, right. 
And, 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 in, and in the various um, examples of reception that you've, that you've seen, do, do any of you strike, do any of them strike you as just abuses of, of her work or her, you know, ethos? So I guess I'm not so concerned about ways that she's turned into things that I don't like. Uh -huh. I would rather have conversations about those. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'll be concerned, for instance, if all that's left with, uh, all we're left with is the Austin porn. If that's all we're left with, that would make me sad. <laughs> uh, but I don't mind if Austin porn is sitting alongside the, the zombies and the Christian romances. Mm -hmm. I think all of these are ways of reimagining how literature works in our lives and how her stories bring us to new ideas about meaningful lives in a world that's often deeply unfair. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, we're, we're just about at the end of our experiment here. And um, this has been an amazing experience. I've never done anything like this. I, have any of you done anything like this? <laughs> um, and I want to thank you all for joining us in this uh, first uh, MLA Humanities in Five uh, event. Um, in closing, I want to remind you that there is a, another shoe that is going to drop. It's the second Humanities in Five, which is tomorrow. It's a contest of people who actually signed up to do this. <laughs> they were not uh, uh, sort of uh, roped in. Um, and so tomorrow it'll be at 3.30. Uh, it'll be session 553. And it'll be held in Crystal Ballroom C in the Hyatt here. I want to thank you all for joining us and um, hope you have a wonderful evening and hope to see you tomorrow at the contest. <laughs>